Land, as mentioned by the House of Lords in Barclays Bank and Coleman, is considered as the most valuable assets for mankind. It is the primary source of wealth and foundation for the development of human civilization. Every single jurisdiction in the world has undisputedly agreed to the importance of protecting the land, taking different forms of measure to regulate the land ownerships. The concept of land restoration can be traced as early as 3000 BC in ancient Egypt. Since then, different jurisdictions have constantly reformed their land restoration system. In modern English land law, registered means the title to land is recorded in a register maintained by Her Majesty Land Registry, as shown in the case of Franks and others. The title itself contains information like the quality of the title, general description of the land, and identity of the estate owner. The fact that the system depends on registration of title but not land means that it is possible for a land to have more than one type of title registered in respect of it. For example, a piece of land might be identified as a registered fee symbol and a registered long list as shown in the case of Brighton and Hove City Council. In England and Wales, the history of land management is lengthy and complicated. Prior to the year of 1857, there were a lot of discussion, debates and reform in English land law. But the history of land registration system only truly begins in 1857 when the Royal Commission of Registration of Title proposed a registration system. This subsequently led to the enactment of Land Registration Act 1862, which was the first act in relation to the land title registration. The Land Registration Act 1862 was introduced by Lord Chancellor Richard Bechtel, which provides the registration system for both freehold and leasehold titles only. Soon after its enactment, serious structural flaws were found, such as there was no compulsion for title registration. It was possible for the person registered as the owner of a property to cease to be the owner while remaining on the register. Until 1897, Lord Chancellor Hardy Gifford introduced the Land Transfer Act 1897, which was brought uh, which brought in the element of compulsion into the registration system. The implementation of compulsory registration subsequently led to the expansion of Her Majesty Land Registry in England and Wales. However, the legislation in relation to land was lack of protection and has created many problems, which subsequently instigated the enactment of a set of 1935 land legislation, which inaugurated a fundamental change in the structure of land law in England and Wales. Before that, the mechanics of conveyancing were hindered by formalism and beset with dangers for the bona fide purchaser. For example, the purchaser might find their land burdened by legal rights of which they have no knowledge of, as shown in wills and owner. Moreover, the reliance on title deeds to prove ownership of land was also cumbersome and expensive. Therefore, the 1925 property legislation, which includes Law of Property Acts 1925, the Settled Land Act 1925 and the Land Registration Act 1925 have sought to simplify and codify the land registration procedure, as mentioned by the court in the case of State Bank of India and Seoul. Fun fact, the original 1925 timetable called for full registration of all titles by 31st of December in 1955. Nonetheless, only on 1st of December 1990 did all Englands and Wales become subject to compulsory registration of title. Obviously, it will be a while longer before universal registration of title is achieved, but currently, over 80% of all potential registrable land are registered. The land registration concept in modern English land law was derived from the Land Registration Act 1925. Although it was not perfect as recognized by the Law Commission Report No. 271, but it was able to cope with the fundamental economic and social changes that took place over the time with the help of judicial, inter judicial interpretations. Today, the modern English land law in relation to land registration was mainly governed by, by the Land Registration Act 2002, which significantly amended the original scheme. Most of the details of land registration are contained in the 2002 Act and the Land Registration Rule. The 2002 Act was a joint project between the Land Registry and the, and the Law Commission, which seek to implement a number of policies. First, it seeks to ensure that as many states in land as possible become registered along with all relevant con information including third parties' rights. Second, it seeks to minimize the number and effect of third parties' proprietary rights that might against the owner's interests, otherwise known as unregistered interests that override. Third, the implementation of e-commerce that is the registration and transfer of titles. All these legislative purposes since 1925 until today that are contained in LRA 2002 are actually the restatement of three fundamental operating principles of English modern land law regarding the registration system. First, the curtain principle which encapsulates the idea that certain equitable interests in land should be hidden behind the curtain of a special type of trust. In other words, the, pur the purchaser need to be concerned about the legal title but not every equitable interest that might exist. This principle aims to facilitate the 
alienability of land by freeing the purchaser from the effort and worry of dealing with equitable owners. Second, the insurance principle which encapsulates the idea that if a title is duly registered, it is guaranteed by the state. This guarantee is supported by a system of statutory indemnity, in other words, monetary compensation for any purchaser who suffer loss by reason of the conclusive nature of the register. The state insures against deficiency, inaccuracy, or other mistake in the register. Third, the mirror, the mirror principle which encapsulates the idea that the register should reflect the totality of the rights and interests concerning a title of a registered land. Third, inspection of the register should reveal all information about the land. Despite all these meaningful and beautiful legislative purposes and operating principles in modern English land law, it is, still it is still disputable today whether the register is able to reflect every information of the land which is in line with the mirror principle. I'll be talking about the mirror principle. One of the fundamental principles behind registered land is the mirror principle, which is to reflect accurately and completely and beyond all arguments the current facts that are material to a man's title. This means that the inspection of the register should reveal the identity of the owner, the nature of his ownership, any limitations on his ownership, and any rights enjoyed by other persons over the land that are adverse to the owner. The point is simply that if the register reflects the full character of the land, any purchaser and any third party can rest assured that they are fully protected. Conveyances, therefore, theoretically should be able to look at the register and ascertain any matters that might adversely affect their client. With the introduction of the Land Registration Act 2002, it can be said that the land registration in England and Wales has embarked on a new voyage destined to achieve the essence of the mirror principle. The aim of the 2002 Act is to enable a purchaser of the land, subject to certain defined exceptions, to be able to rely on the entries in the registered title as an accurate expression of title so that it is possible to investigate title to the land online and with the absolute minimum of additional inquiries and inspection. The motivation behind this change is to promote certainty within conveyancing transactions for buyer, seller and those individuals who may possess one of the numerous third-party rights. The overarching concept of the mirror principle remains a fundamental one to the system of registered conveyancing and is strengthened by the 2002 Act in several ways. This can be seen where the failure to register a transaction when required for legal freehold free and leasehold means that the transferee obtains only an equitable title to the land. Moreover, having a category of interests that are only protectable by registration and by extending the compulsory registration of leases with terms of 7 years or more as compared to the previous 21 years or more is another way to uphold this principle. Moreover, LRA 2002 has a system of title by registration rather than registration of title, which was the philosophy behind the earlier act. Section 58 of LRA 2002 therefore provides that the register is conclusive proof of ownership. Put simply, the person the register shows as proprietor of a legal estate will be its owner by virtue of registration even if that person would not otherwise be the owner, subject to provisions of this Act. This had in direct equivalent in the 1925 Act at Section 69. This automatic vesting of the legal estate in land in the registered proprietor has been referred to as a statutory magic. However, the mirror principle can never be complete until everything affecting the title and the legal use and enjoyment of land is reflected on the register. This means that the category of overriding interest ideally should be abolished or, if this is not possible, drastically reduced. To have a series of interests both legal and equitable, not on the register, which bind a legal owner of land regardless of notice, is inconsistent with the whole concept of registered title. There appears to be a contradiction between the idea behind registered land and the group of overriding interests in registered land. The contradiction is evident in English land law as there are situations where the register cannot be accurate because of the existence of overriding interests which do not appear on the register at all and where the land is registered with good leasehold titles. One of the criticisms made of the 1925 Act was that it allowed too many interests to override the register. Hence, the Law Commission recommended a reduction in the scope of overriding interests which was received by the statutory support by the 2002 Act. The list of interests which have, been overriding, which have overriding status has been shortened and clarified. Nevertheless, one of the reasons for the existence of overriding interests is there is a danger of making the register too bulky. The fundamental purpose of registration is to put down in one place as, as simply as possible everything that is of future and present importance to the title. If a title is complex because there are many rights and liabilities affecting land, that is all the more reason why they should be expressed as clearly as possible in a place which is readily accessible to a purchaser. 
Mirrors do not conceal objects if the reflection is unpleasant. Yet, the Land Registration Act 2002 contains provision that render the mirror principle as applied to land registration wanting. Thus, the register should amount to a comprehensive picture of the land for any prospective purchaser. The inclusion of overriding interest within denies the mirror principle. This contradiction leads to the distortion of the mirror image, which many may call cracked in the mirror principle. It is evident that the English land law upholds a cracked mirror principle rather than a mirror principle itself. In order to assess the crack and the extent of it, it is necessary to examine particular controversial sections of the group in light of recent cases. The mirror principle does not operate fully in the system of registered land in England and Wales, even under the LRA 2002, and it was never meant to. Under the LRA 2002, overriding interest may take effect against the first registered proprietor after compulsory or voluntary first registration of title, which are defined in Schedule 1 and 3 of the 2002 Act. The interests listed in Schedule 1 are leasehold estate with only limited special exceptions. Legal leases originally granted for 7 years or less will override a first registration. Importantly, however, all leases that qualify as overriding interest under the old Section 70, Subsection 1, Subsection K of the LRA 1925 before the entry of force of the LRA 2002 will continue to override and no additional action needs to be taken to, pro to protect them while the current tenant remains the estate owner, as shown in Hopkins and Beacon. The registrar should treat the registered proprietor's response as, a, as raising an objection and, the, and requiring application to the dealt with under Schedule 6, Paragraph 5 if a reasonable registrar would have reached to that conclusion. Thus, the registered proprietor's failure to indicate clearly that this was a cause of action he desired is not fatal. The three exceptions to the overriding status of short-term leases are of, a, are of a special kind and as such required to be registered as titles in their own right irrespective of the length of lease. They cannot override even if of seven years or less. These, these are the grant of lease out of unregistered land in pursuance of Part 5 of the Housing Act 1985 under the right to buy provision. The, the grant of a lease out of unregistered land of a dwelling house to a private sector landlord by the tenant's right to buy a preserve and the grant of lease out of unregistered land that is to take effect of possession more than three months of the date of the grant. This illustrates well the policy of the 2002 Act. A tenant under a short-term legal lease is likely to be in possession and so his lease is easily discoverable by an intending purchaser of the land and hence perfectly acceptable as an overriding interest where the purchaser will know of the lease. Next, interest of a person in actual occupation. This echoes a concept found in the old law in Section 70, Subsection 1, Subsection G of the LRA 1925 and although the provision is not identical, the old case law of the meaning of actual occupation will necessarily carry through the 2002 Act. In particular, three points should be noted. First, there is no protection of the interest of persons in receipt of rent and profits of the land per se as there was under the 1925 Act. Secondly, the enforceability of the interest protected is now limited to the land actually occupied by the interest holder. And third, there is no qualification relating to disclosure of interest as there is relation in Schedule 3 and as there was under the 1925 Act. Schedule 1, paragraph 2 defines the overriding interest as an interest belonging to a person in actual occupation so far as to, as to relating to the land which he in actual occupation except for an interest under the Settlement, under Settled Land Act 1925. It is true that the actual occupation is a question of fact to be determined by the reference to circumstances in each case. In many instances, it will be rather straightforward um, analysis of the facts. The meaning of actual occupation under the 2002 Act was considered in some land in Thompson and Foy in 2009, with further analysis, with analysis further developed by the Court of Appeal in Link Lending Limited against Buster in 2010, although both of these cases concerned in Schedule 3 of the 2002 Act, which does have an additional requirement of discoverability, there is no reason to think that the actual occupation itself is different under, is different under Schedule 1. Moving on to legal easements, this category of overriding interest replaces the difficult Section 70, Subsection 1, Subsection A of the LRA 1925 and its simplicity itself. Thus, a legal easement of profit up and draw will override. Indeed, prior to the first registration, these rights will have bound the estate as legal rights to binding the whole world, and so the fact that they override first registration merely continues as a priority they already enjoy. Importantly, however, 
and re representing in the representing a change in the law, equitable easements will not override a first registration of title once again because of the interplay between the first registration and the rules of the unregistered convincing. The overriding status of all legal easements and profits at first registration is, is not con controversial. Indeed, in many instances, these legal interests will be in fact entered on the register against the title at first registration and will then cease to be overriding. Customary rights, however, are expressly preserved in paragraph 4 and encompasses the rights enjoyed by all or some inhabitants of the particular area. Public rights are also remain also remain a category of overriding interest under the 2002 Act under paragraph 5 and it means that these rights are exciable by anyone including non-land owners simply by reason of general law, example, public rights of way and rights of passage in navigable waters. These are not to be confused with land charges under the Land Charges Act 1972, but are instead within the Local Land Charges Act 1975 and relate such matters as planning, highways and other local authority matters. In addition, rights in relation to mines and minerals are also overridden under paragraph 7, 8 and 9 of the, of the Schedule 1 in a similar fashion to the old section 70, subsection 1, subsection L and subsection M of the 1925 Act. They include the rights of coal and older mineral rights. Paragraphs 10 to 14 of paragraphs and paragraph 16 of Schedule 1 contains a miscellany of rights and interests originally override a first registration of title. As a group, they have little or little in common save their feudal ancestry, but they share the same fate in that they were override only 10 years from the entry into force of the schedule. In other words, these rights cease to override with effect from midnight 12 October 2013. Thus, although they continue to bind the unregistered title pending the first registration being legal interest, they will cease to bind on first registration unless protected at that time by the entry of a notice. Clearly, Schedule 1 to the Act seeks to rationalize the types of interest that can override at fir a first registration. There are some changes in definition, but also some include exclusions when compared to the previous law. The Act separates overriding interests that may take effect against a first registered proprietor or against a person who becomes a registered proprietor or the transfer of a title that is already registered. As for Schedule 3 of the LRA 2002, there are a variety of unregistered rights which qualify as overriding interests. These include legal leases granted for a term not more than seven years, proprietary interests of persons in actual occupation of the land, legal easements and profits a quatuor, and a local land charges, all of which is separated to four different paragraphs. The justification for having a category of interest which exists outside the register is that they will be discoverable on inspections. We will further dwell to see what is the standard of reasonably discoverable on inspection, but before that, let's go into paragraph 1 of the leasehold estates in land. It provides that a leasehold estate granted for a term not exceeding 7 years from a date of grant overrides registered disposition, subject to 7 exceptions. The first 3 are the same as those that apply in the first register and the other four apply in respect of a lease granted by the proprietor of a registered estate or charged where the grant constitutes a registrable disposition required to be completed by registration. They are a lease which is granted to take effect in possession of more than three months into the future, a discontinuous lease commonly thought of as a timeshare where the lease grants exclusive possession for periods which are not ex ex uh, consecutive, a right to buy a lease under Part 5 of the Housing Act 1985, and a lease granted by a private sector landlord to a person who is formerly a secured tenant and has a preserved right to buy. Moving into paragraph 2, which provides that an interest belonging to a person in actual occupation of land overrides registered disposition, subject to four exceptions. The first exception is the same as the exception that applies on first registration, that is, where the interest arises under a settlement under the Settled Land Act 1925. The second exception adopts one of the uh, principles under the current law. If the person with that interest is asked before the disposition occurs and he or she fails to disclose the interest when that could reasonably have been expected, then overriding status is lost. A new exception relates to the rights of a person whose occupations would not have been obvious on a reasonably careful inspection of the land at the time of the disposition, which the person acquiring the interest did not know about at the time. The failure to test a form as formulated in the Act, it is the occupation that has to be obvious and not the interest. Lastly, there is accepted from overriding status a leasehold estate grant to take effect in possession more than three months from the date of grant, but which has not taken effect in possession at the time of the disposition. This exception will not apply and will only occur when the lease in question has not been registered and the person to whom the lease was granted was for some other reason already in occupation. The familiar example where a person in the actual occupation under equitable interest in the land, in the case of Williams and Glynn's Bank, um, and Boland, where a wife who had contributed to the 
purchase price of the house had an overriding interest against the bank, which her husband had mortgaged it. Additionally, as Denning MR mentioned in the Strand Securities and Caswell, a person in actual occupation is protected from having his rights lost in the Weller welter of registration moving into the third interest. Paragraph 3 talks about legal easements and profits a fatwa. Where the easements of profits has been exercised in the year before the disposition, a purchaser will be bound. Lastly, with respect to paragraph 4 on local land charges override, where but they should be discoverable by a local land charges search carried out before purchase. Therefore, in totality, it is clear that Schedule 3 of the LRA 2002 has substantially reduced the extent of overriding interest to which these interests can buy a purchaser or on a subsequent registration of title. So that a purchaser will not be bound if the occupation would not have been obvious on a reasonable inspection of the land at the time of the disposition. No purchaser can be confident that the register is completely accurate as it will not include overriding interest and there is the further exception of good leasehold. The question statement is submitting the point that if the register reflects the full character of the land, any purchaser and third party can rest assured they are fully protected. However, as explained by my learned friends as well as Section 33 of the LRA excluded interest, the register cannot strictly, technically speaking, be said to reflect the full character of the land. As per Peter Gibson Lord Justice in the case of Overseas Investment Limited against Simcoe Bill Construction Limited 1995, the register of a title is not a perfect mirror of the title to a registered property. It is not possible to rely on entries to the register as a complete record of everything that affects the land. Furthermore, these certain interests, sometimes called the crack in the mirror of title, are deemed to be important enough that they can override a registered disposition even if they do not appear on the register. Thus, it is not disputed that the register, practically speaking, can never fully reflect the full character of the land. It is, however, a reality we have to live with as, on the grounds of public policy, there will perhaps always be interests which will need protection against the purchaser, where it will be unreasonable to register the interest. It is submitted a fully reflective register is impractical, and English land law can never fully reflect, reflect the above question statement. However, the above statement regarding any purchaser and any third party can rest assured they are fully protected. It's still viable. This current system still ensures their protection, and I will now evaluate why the current system is sufficient in that regard. To start off, the imperative of the LRA 2002 is to ensure that as much as possible about the land is registered, and more importantly here, to ensure those rights that are not registrable to be capable of discovery by a normal inspection of the land. Therefore, as per Martin Dixon, the purchaser should inspect the register and the land and should thereby be able to discover all that he needs to know. The point of the LRA 2002 and title registration as a whole was never to exclude the purchaser's participation in the conveyancing process. The purchaser must still do his part and inspect intuitively the register and the land. Additionally, LRA 2002 has decreased the categories of rights capable of overriding and has altered those that remain to give the purchaser a very real chance of discovering their existence before a sale is completed. Furthermore, as can be seen in Section 71 of the LRA 2002, there is now a general duty to disclose unregistered rights which override to the registrar, so that they may be brought onto the register when a title changes hands. Moreover, when title to land is registered, the registrar awards a grade of titles such as absolute, possessory, and qualified. The relevant section of LRA 2002 to look at is Section 9, Titles to Freehold, which spells out the classes of title with which the applicant may be registered as proprietor R. The grade of title is important in determining the extent to which the proprietor is bound by pre-existing adverse rights. The result is that the registrar does give an accurate indication of the status of the registered proprietor's title. Finally, Modern land law has the curtain principle, which as explained in the introduction, can help in ensuring the security of any purchaser or third party with equitable interests without the need for the purchaser to know everything. Differently said, the purchaser only needs to be concerned with the legal title of the land and need not worry about any equitable rights of ownership that might exist. The curtain principle works as, looking at sections 2 and 27 of the LPA 1925, any such equitable rights will be overreached if the proper formalities of the purchase are observed. As a result, consequently, these equitable rights will not affect the purchaser in his enjoyment of the land. However, it must be noted that while the curtain principle operates effectively in the majority of cases, there are times when it fails. One case to keep note of is in the case of Williams and Glynne's Bank against Boland 1981, where perhaps it then may become necessary for the purchaser to look behind the curtain. All that being said, the current register system, while not being fully reflective, has so far worked well enough to safeguard the interests of parties involved.
As a conclusion, on a general level, the current land registration system now has brought more certainty, fairness and simplicity compared to the pre-1925 situations. It is undeniable that the register is not able to reflect a complete accurate information of the land register, but it doesn't mean that it is not reflective or inaccurate at all. It is just not as comprehensive as the mirror, but it is slowly becoming so.